Let's dig into it all now with our roundtable. New York Democratic Congressman Richie Torres, USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page, New York Times The Argument podcast host Jane Koston, and pollster and communications advisor Frank Luntz. So, Susan, you are our resident uh, Nancy Pelosi <laughs> expert as her biographer. I want to start there. It, you think she's going to go to Taiwan even though Biden's made it clear that they don't want her to go? Hey, good luck telling Nancy Pelosi where she can and cannot go. She's been protesting on the issue of Chinese record on human rights since she arrived in Congress decades ago. Remember in 1991, she unfurled a ban. She was on a congressional delegation to Beijing, went to Tiananmen Square, unfurled a pro-democracy banner, which really riled up uh, China. So uh, as well, Clinton, she didn't listen to his entreaties uh, during his presidency about uh, taking a softer line on China. And I do not think she'll be swayed even by another Democratic president. Any concern among this, uh, Congressman, in your, in your caucus about Pelosi defying, essentially defying the Biden administration? Well, it's not the place of the Biden administration to dictate where the Speaker and members of Congress can travel. If there are security concerns, those concerns can be presented to us in a private setting. But we have to be careful not to send the message that the United States can easily be bullied by China or can be intimidated by bellicose rhetoric, because if we allow ourselves to be bullied, then it will never stop. Um, this is the speaker's decision to make and hers alone. All right, let's, let's turn to the domestic agenda. Uh, Frank, you've seen a good news for Biden this past week. He got a, a major semiconductor bill passed. Uh, he's got a deal with Manchin. Manchin's on board with Build Back Better, sort of. Uh, it, it, what do you think? Does uh, Manchin just give him a lifeline? I don't think this is significant. I have a You don't think it's significant? I have a simple question. Yeah. Are Americans better off today than they were two years ago? Yeah. Uh, are you nervous about filling your tank up with gas? We know that half of Americans can't do it. One out of five have to return food when they get to the cashier because they simply can't afford it. That this is too much about Washington and not about the quality of life of the average individual. I, I know that he likes to argue whether inflation was transitory, and now he's arguing over a recession. The fact is, this sounds Orwellian. Don't argue over the words. If you can't afford not just what you want, but what you need, that is, by definition, a recession, and people are suffering right now. So, so you're saying it's not a big deal in terms of the impact on the, on the midterm. Not but, only I mean, is, this is a this is a major bill. But, but there's advice to the president, which is don't argue over semantics. That's my job as a language guy, right. your job- You're the guy that does argue over words. <laughs> yes, and, and it's really unseemly for the president to be fighting over the definition when people are genuinely suffering out there. Yeah, I mean, I mean Jane, that does not seem to be the best argument is let, let's fight over the meaning of the word recession. Especially right. because we may end up, you know, finding out that we are in a recession. Right, exactly. And it, you know, this is not the first time that we've quibbled, that people have quibbled over what a recession is or isn't. We saw that uh, under the Bush administration in 2008, which as I recall, didn't go well for anyone <laughs> involved, uh, especially if you were graduating from college in that time. I think that what, what is or is not a recession should not be dictated by people who are likely to not suffer the brunt of a recession. But I do think that focusing on what the bill can do for regular people, talking about what's affordable, talking about what's not affordable, rather than getting into like the concept of inflation, which I think for many people is like, things cost more than they did the year before, which is a global problem, but can have domestic solutions. And people should be taking it seriously domestically, not just getting you know wrapped up in the politics of it. The point of politics is to get something done. The point of politics is not the process by which it is done. But, but Congressman, how much resentment is there for Manchin? I mean, you, you sort of what Bernie Sanders said, you know, he's not the only <laughs> member of the Democratic caucus in the Senate. Uh, I mean, this is all him. This was negotiated, this was him and Schumer. Uh, I have been lamenting what I call the tyranny of Manchin for a long time, <laughs> but, but I'm happy that we've landed the plane. Yeah. And, you know, the... Is, is it landed yet, by the way? I mean, is this going to pass? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, uh, but there's the second tyranny of Kirsten Cinema, uh, so stay tuned. Um, but um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will land the plane. And if, if we pass the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, President Biden would have presided over five landmark legislative achievements from the American Rescue Plan to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill to the Bipartisan Gun Safety Bill to the Bipartisan Semiconductor and Scientific Research and Development Bill to the Inflation Reduction Act. That level of bipartisan achievement would have been unthinkable 
in a period of peak partisanship and polarization. So there's a disconnect between the reality of what Biden has accomplished and the media narrative about his presidency in peril. But the reality is that people still can't afford gas. And what I'm nervous about is with this Ukrainian conflict, food prices are going to become even more expensive and even more scarce. The reality for them is that this is legislation. It doesn't affect them from the moment they wake up in the morning until the moment they go to sleep at night. And that's the challenge for the president. He can point to bipartisanship, although Nancy Pelosi always talked about how partisan the Republicans are. In the end, the quality of life of the people that you represent, and you represent them well, their quality of life is suffering. Yeah, but let me disagree with you on, whether, on the dimensions of this bill. This is a big deal. Yeah. This is the largest piece of climate change legislation in our nation's history. It's a way to energize people who really care about climate change to go to the polls. Uh, in November, that's been a problem for Democrats up to now. You know, also the, the repercussions of the Supreme Court decision on abortion, I think, is also beginning to really fuel Democratic energy to turn out to vote. We have a poll out today that shows two-thirds of Democrats say they are more likely to vote in November because of the Supreme Court decision and what, because of what they've seen happen on abortion access since then. And that is, Democrats have a tough road to hoe. Inflation's a big problem, but that is very good news for Democrats. I also want to think that one of the things I keep thinking about is that if you, if you, you know, the Republicans right now are the opposition party. That is where they like to be. If Republicans could be the opposition party for the rest of our natural lives, they would be thrilled. Because the answer is, what would Republicans do to counter inflation? What would Republicans do about Ukraine? And I feel as if with this particular class of Republicans, I feel like what we would get is another anti-big tech bill yelling about Section 230 and not a lot of responsiveness to the needs of the American people. There's a reason why millions of Americans are increasingly turned off by both parties. What if that means a third party? Well, it never does. But it does mean that people are increasingly irritated by both parties. And if your options are, you, if you are disappointed with Democrats and you look to the Republican Party, I don't know if you're seeing a lot of answers. I think you're seeing a lot of screaming. You're more, so, so, but, so, but, but you raise a very good point. In the polling that was done by Gallup, more people have a negative opinion over the institutions that run this country than ever before. All-time lows. And it's not just the White House or Congress or Republican or Democrat. It's the courts, the Supreme Court. It's health care. It's doctors. It's everybody right now. And, John, at a certain point, this fragile coalition that we call the United States, at a certain point, it could come apart. I know you make fun of me for being a pessimist. Well, sometimes pessimists are correct. I am pessimistic. I am afraid of, of credibility, and I think we have to tell people the truth. And that's why I go back to the recession. Tell people the truth. If they feel like they're in a recession, they are. I think the reality is far more complicated. I mean, when you think of a recession, what comes to mind is significant unemployment. Unemployment is at historic lows, 3.6%. Uh, so I think the term recession denies the reality of a strong labor market, which is as strong as it's ever been. So the picture is far more complicated. But, but, but do, do your constituents feel you're in a, I think, are they hurting? Are, are, they, are they worried about the, the state of the economy? I think my constituents are struggling to put food on that they won't pay the bills yeah. because of inflation, which is a real problem. But even on that front, some progress has been made. Gas prices have been falling dramatically uh, for more than six weeks. And if it continues to fall at that trajectory, then it might come back to much more normal levels. Okay, so I, speaking of this question of credibility, I, I want to, Susan, get you to kind of help explain Democrats going in and, and, and putting millions of dollars in, in, in states and races across the country to support candidates that are like Trump Jr. You know, that, 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 that I don't mean Donald Trump Jr., I mean like, like, pres <laughs> like President Jr., uh, you know, saying the election was stolen, uh, all of that stuff, including Peter Meyer. I mean, this is one of the 10 who voted to impeach Donald Trump. And now you have the DCCC going in and supporting uh, his Republican primary challenger. You know, it's risky and it's hypocritical. Uh, it's risky because sometimes the candidate you don't expect to win turns out to be stronger than you think, and they win, and then they're in office. And it's hypocritical because Democrats have been saying that election deniers threaten our very democracy. So you're going to go out and, in effect, campaign for an election denier uh, because you've got made a political calculation that it might serve your interest. Uh, I think it means Democrats cede the high ground on this. So uh, let, let me say, say what one of the, your fellow Democratic colleagues in the House had sure. to say about this. 
Uh, this is Kathleen Rice. She said, dirty tricks like this are part and parcel of political campaigns. But when you talk about putting money behind candidates who want to come to Washington and destroy our democracy, it's not a political dirty trick anymore. It's unconscionable. And, and, and that's, that's what it is. They're putting money behind candidates who, in her words, want to come to Washington and destroy our democracy. What, what do you think of this? It's embarrassingly hypocritical. I mean, we cannot credibly defend democracy and then prop up candidates who are an existential threat to the very democracy that we're defending. And in politics, when you try to be too cute and clever, it often backfires. The DCCC is not God. It cannot guarantee the outcome of the general election. And when you prop up a conspiracy theorist in a Republican primary, you run the risk of sending an extremist to the United States Congress. And that's an egregious misuse of democratic resources. So do you think the DTRIP will, uh, will reverse on this? Uh, hopefully under pressure from members, because there are a number of members like myself who are displaced. And I also think like this is reflective of a strategy that I remember from 2010 with Christine O'Donnell. Um, Google her, it's fine. <laughs> don't, don't she worry wasn't about a witch, by the way. She was not a witch. <laughs> this, it's funny because I'm like, this was an amusing moment in politics, but it wasn't. Because it was this idea of like, if you push the extremist, they'll be so extreme that obviously voters will be turned off by them. This isn't that time anymore. And I think that it's worth noting that the DCCC did not make Republicans choose a number of these candidates. They did not force people to choose Doug Mastriano in, in Pennsylvania, someone who's gotten a lot of assistance from one of the most rabid anti-Semites to ever grace the Internet. They didn't, that wasn't forced. There isn't that much primary crossover to get a lot of these candidates supported. These are bad candidates. And then for the DCCC to decide that it's 2010 again and they can make some fun financial move of backing these candidates full well, full well knowing that all of these races are going to be close because of how polarized our country is and especially how polarized a lot of these regions are. Like you're messing around in elections in Pennsylvania and Michigan, Michigan, especially the Grand Rapids area, which is a historically red district. What are you doing? Like, I don't have the time to deal with the stress of this and the stress of college football season. <laughs> I don't have it in me. I mean, in Maryland, they, they supported a guy that literally bust people into Washington on January 6th and called Mike Pence a traitor as uh, people were, were charging into the Capitol uh, at saying, hang Mike Pence. Well, it's fascinating to me to watch Trump endorsing some candidates and Pence endorsing others that you feel like you already have 2024 happening right now. Look, it's the reason why the public believes our democracy is broken. They believe that leadership is broken. And most importantly, they believe that you guys have to get something done. That Republicans and Democrats, it's the one thing that they agree on. Please, Washington, listen to them, learn from them, do something, help them. Jane? And I think they're, and that's not what they're getting, right? Yeah. They're getting right now is people being 11 times too cute for their own good. There's something that I, I just keep thinking about, again, that the point of politics is to do things. It's to get the, the bridge built or the bill passed or get folks funded or, you know, solve problems that people have. Right, it is not the process. On that note, we are out of time.